Very insightful conversation. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Tomas, Expo Content Co-Chair, and I will be the, your host for the rest of this morning. Now, I would like to introduce the next session, what Bitcoin did at the Expo. This show is going to uh, be presented by Peter McCormack, the, the, the creator and, and the host of the podcast with the same name, which, by the way, I'm a big fan. Um, Peter, in, in his show, he covers uh, topics like uh, freedom, censorship, uh, human rights, and of course, Bitcoin. So he's the right person to talk uh, to our next two speakers. To talk about uh, Taproot, we're going to have Andrew Poster, research director at Blockstream and Bitcoin contributor since 2011. And right after, we're going to have Lisa Nigel, uh, to talk about Lightning Network. She's senior software engineer at Blockstream and maintainer of C Lightning open source project. Well, uh, we're not going to take a, a slide of questions for this session. And uh, without any further ado, welcome Peter and Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, really great to hear Michael Saylor talking again. Um, he totally changed my approach to my business with his ideas around Bitcoin and has put my own company in a much better position. So it's great to hear from him. Uh, and Andrew, great to see you again, man. First time we met was in uh, Boston. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was a few years ago now. Yeah, when we did our, our, our infamous first show together. That everyone yeah, seems to yeah. love. And my eye was dying. How are you, man? Good to see oh, you. I'm good, I'm good. A little tired, I'm up early. Um, but uh, but things, are, things are not too bad. I think this year, yeah. year's feeling better than the last so far. So yeah, fingers crossed. We'll be out of lockdown soon. And we'll all be doing these conferences again in person and hanging out and having a beer. Um, right. Good to see you. Always love talking to you. Usually we talk about stuff. I have no idea what it's you're talking about, but you have a way of a uh, way of breaking it down for people to make it a little bit easier to understand. So today we're going to talk about taproot, which is one of those things which is super important for Bitcoin, yet won't affect most people, or most people won't realize how it affects them. Um, but as a starting point, just for anyone who doesn't know, can you please explain what Taproot is, what it enables, and why this is such an important uh, upgrade for Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was thinking about this a bit, like how as, how I would explain this. As you say, like it won't directly affect most users in a way that's dramatically visible. Um, I guess the most visible thing might be um, the since SegWit, we've had these new BC1 addresses. If you look closely, that's BC1Q. Every app address starts with BC1Q, and after Taproot, they'll start with BC1P. And that's going to be the biggest difference. But secretly, what's happening uh, behind the scenes, oh, I guess one other thing, they'll be longer, typically. So right now, there are two different lengths of addresses that you use, assuming you're using like these post, post uh, SegWit addresses. Right? There's kind of the short ones that you use for an ordinary wallet, and those represent a single key that your wallet is holding. You can spend the coins if you have a secret key. Um, and that's what ownership means, is holding the secret key, right? But Bitcoin supports more interesting things than just single key, single coin kind of transfers, right? You can have multiple keys, you can do multi-signatures, you can have different policies that take effect at different times or that are active at different times. Like you could have a, a two or three policy and then like a dead man switch, where if the coins don't move in a year, then maybe some other keys suddenly become active and you can spend the coins. You can do weird tricks with hash premages and stuff. So the Lightning Network uses that. And you might, might talk about that a little bit with Lisa. And the way this is done with something is with something called Bitcoin Script, which is a small, weird programming language that lets you do um, it lets you do various things with signatures, it lets you do various things with hash premages, with time locks. And combine these in various ways in what's called a monotone function. You can have like um, any conjunction of these, a bunch of like and this and this and this and this. You can have ors, this or this or this or this, or thresholds. I guess three of three of these five things kind of things. So if you're doing something more interesting than just one key, if you're using Bitcoin script, I should say, right now there is a longer address format in SegWit. And in Taproot, everything is going to use this new longer address format. The Q will become a P. But behind the scenes, so I'm kind of kind of underselling this here, right? It's just all these all these cosmetic things. Behind the scenes, there's actually a dramatic change that is happening. 
And the change is that unlike in the existing SegWit address formats, where your address secretly represents the hash of a key in the, in the short case or the hash of a, of a script in the long case, now in Taproot, it will always represent a key. And this is kind of interesting, right? Because this is not a reduction in functionality. Of course, we aren't just saying, oh, no more scripts. We can just like, um, the keys, keys are the best, right? Well, the reason that we are having a single exposed key is that we've learned over the years that we can do a lot of cool stuff with keys. And in particular, you can turn a key into a hash of a script. And that's really what Taproot is doing here. So the idea here is we take a, an ordinary signing key right? There's a secret key to it. You know, if you hold the secret key, you can move the coins. It's possible to tweak that key in a way that it actually embeds a hash of a script inside of it. It becomes a commitment. It becomes a hash. And by doing so, you change what the key is a little bit, and you also change what the secret key is a little bit. But the idea is that anybody who knew the original secret key will know the new tweaked secret key. And anybody who didn't know the original secret key will, will not know the tweaked one, right? So we preserve this ownership property, but we're able to use the hash. And the trick here is, well, let me add one more trick we can do with keys and then, then I'll, I'll show how this fits together. The other trick we can do um, now that we're thinking about Schnorr signatures versus ECDSA, we're thinking about changing the way we sign things, is that it's possible to have multiple participants who own a single key, where I can think of a key, you can think of a key, we can actually add those together in a certain sense. And then we get a, a key that belongs to both of us in the sense that you and I can cooperatively produce a signature to move the coins controlled by those keys, but neither of us individually can do it. And of course, third parties have, have nothing, they, they, they can't do anything. So the thinking behind Taproot is if we can do these multi-signatures, if we can do these threshold signatures, if we can do, if there's some other cool stuff you can do with keys, just with the keys, then where do we need script? Well, there are a few places that we do need script, but typically the place where you need script is if you have some sort of emergency clause or if you have like a time locked back out kind of condition. And an example of where you see that is in like the lightning network where when you move coins into a funding channel, um, into a payment channel, you do what's called a funding transaction where when you open the channel, you take some coins and you put them into basically a two of two multi-signature output with your counterparty, with the other person on the other side of the payment channel. And when you do so, you run a risk that your counterparty is going to disappear, right? Like if they just go away and your coins are in this two of two output, well, now you're screwed, right? Because you need both parties to sign. So how can you be sure that you're not going to blackwell your funds when you join the Northern Network? And the way that you're sure of that is that you have this, um, what's called a claim or refund um, construction where you have basically a time-locked backout clause, or actually a time-locked transaction in some cases that will let you claw the funds back if your counterparty disappears. If you move the coins to the funding transaction, um, you have some assurance that the coin will come back to you if, uh, if the other party disappears. But if the other party doesn't disappear, if you just actively use the payment channel like it's intended to be used, then this backout clause is never used. And morally there's no reason that it should ever even hit the blockchain but when you're using bitcoin script when you need to encode this uh in your in the script that's on the chain then it has to be on the chain right in order to make it usable it has to be on the chain the cool thing about taproot here here's where all these ideas come together um is that you can have a key that represents some number of people who all together can jointly sign and the cool thing is you, you can't even tell from a third party perspective from the blockchain, you can't tell if it's one person, you can't tell if it's two, you can't tell if it's a hundred or a threshold or like three or five or, or whatever. Um, if they cooperate, <clears throat> if they cooperate, then they can just produce transactions, they can just sign over. And as far as the, the network knows, there is just a, uh, a key. Somebody produced a signature with that key, the coins moved. If something goes wrong, if one party disappears, only then do you raise your hand and say, hey, that key there, it was actually a commitment to a script. And this script contains a time lock condition. And that time lock condition contains another key. And that key lets me take the coins back. And so you get this backout clause. But the difference between what you could do with Taproot and what you could do before 
is that now this backout clause never appears on the blockchain. It's completely invisible, except in the case that it's actually used. And what this means is that in the cooperative case, in the case that then nobody disappears, nobody breaks protocol, if you have a single wallet with just a single key, or you have a lightning payment channel, or you're doing like an atomic exchange across blockchains, or you're moving coin to the liquid network, or you're doing some sort of exotic thing, these all look like single key, single signature transactions. They all look like ordinary wallet transactions. So you get a boost in privacy, you get a boost in efficiency, because you're not putting stuff on the blockchain that you don't need to. Um, and importantly, this privacy comes from making, improving the fungibility of the coins by making every single output look like basically the same kind of thing. And, and this is cool, of course, from a te technological perspective. It's also cool morally. I feel like we're going in the right direction of moving things, moving things that don't need to be published off of the public blockchain. Right. That's, that's really the direction we want to be going, maximizing privacy in this way. Because that's that's the scalability, it's a scalable way to maximize privacy. It's just not not publish stuff, right? If you don't want people to have to deal with it. Okay. Okay. So in terms of Taproot, this is really cr creating tools for wallet providers and developers. Um, and the only difference I'm gonna see is the uh, yeah. the, the address itself. Yep. Okay, yep. that's cool. Have you been working on Taproot? I have been a little bit. Surprisingly, not as much as you might uh, as you might think. So Taproot originally came from um, from a conversation that I had with Greg Maxwell and, and Peter Woola at a diner in Mountain View, California. We sort of had had a quick conversation. We realized that we could use this this um, way of transforming a key into a hash as a mechanism for a new style of Bitcoin output. And we were really excited because the resulting thing was super small. There was not a lot of room for bike shedding. Um, there was sort of like, there were a lot of forced design decisions here. A lot of cool ideas that we've been talking about over the years like suddenly seemed to fit together in an elegant way. And after that, I spent several months like actually helping to develop this and write software and so forth. And then I kind of moved away from directly working on Taproot to working on some ancillary things in particular, working on these multi-signature schemes that use single keys. Um, there's a scheme called Musig um, that I, I published with Peter and Greg and our friend Yannick Surin um, to do this efficiently, although now it's been superseded by Musig 2. We still don't have my name on it. Um, it was working, right? Yeah, all because I didn't contribute anything and was doing other stuff the whole time. It's not fair. Bullshit. It's bullshit. Right? It is. It is. I should, should fire them all. So uh, I was working on music, I was working on the implementation. Um, and so, you know, music too is a, is a huge uh, improvement on the flexibility of music, which we don't have time to go into. And, and I genuinely, I was not involved. It was, it was a couple of clever, clever tricks from Yannick and from Tim Ruffin um, mm -hmm. and Jonas Nick largely. So I was working on implementing music. I was working on implementing threshold signatures, which are, are kind of the same idea. The idea is that you can have, you can split a key into multiple pieces. You've got three participants say, and any two of them together can produce a signature. I've been working on something called scriptless scripts, which allows you to take two multi-signatures. Like maybe we have a two of two on the Bitcoin network, and then we also have a two of two. Let's put them both on Bitcoin. You know, this is a Bitcoin expo. And the hope is that we can somehow exchange coins in a way where there's no transaction graph. The blockchain doesn't see that we exchange coins. Then we can create a transaction, we can link these transactions in a way that they're atomic, where when I sign for one transaction, maybe the transaction that gives me my coins on the side of the swap, mm -hmm. then I give you some extra data, you can swap the, um, you can transform, sorry, I give you some extra data at the start. So that extra data in conjunction with my signature lets you transform my signature into another signature on another transaction, giving you the money. So I take my money, you see that on the blockchain, you can immediately take your money. But there's nothing that hits the blockchain. The secret is in this extra data that I gave you offline. So for the last year or so, Taproot has been going full board with all sorts of exciting stuff. And mm -hmm. I have been basically working on applications on top of Taproot and not really looking at what's happening on the blockchain layer. And that the blockchain stuff is largely, uh, Peter Willa certainly opened the pull request to Bitcoin Core, which has since been merged to implement Taproot. 
was really a, a massive pull request. It was, it was a magnum of this that, um, that a lot of people reviewed. And um, there are several other names, maybe like a dozen people who've been actively developing. But then what's really exciting about the development this time, this time around, compared to SegWit, compared to anything else we've done in the past, is that we've had probably over 100 active reviewers, like people really digging into this code and asking hard questions and asking to change things and stuff. We've had a lot of eyes on the code. We've had a lot of ideas, eyes on the design. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's just been a lot happening over the last year. Um, How big an upgrade is this like, compared to previous? Like, is this like the biggest ever? The, fun, the funny thing is, uh, the wonderful thing is it's not. Um, how big is it? It's significantly, significantly smaller than SegWit, say. Okay. So SegWit, so, I mean, SegWit was kind of uniquely huge because it was not only a new transaction format, but you're adding this extra um, witness data to the transaction and moving some things out of the, the non-witness part of the transaction into the witness. So that's what segregated witness means. You've got these two parts. Mm -hmm. um, making sure, of course, that everything's still covered by a signature, everything is still committed in a block. Um, so in some sense, there's, there's no change in what's committed and how transactions are structured on the blockchain. But in another like deeply technical sense, there is actually a bit of data that moves to a different area. And when you transfer transactions on the peer-to-peer -peer network, you have to negotiate that. If you have two peers, you need to make sure that the peer that you're talking to um, understands SegWit if you're gonna send them the witness data. If it doesn't understand SegWit, you need to send them the, the strip transactions without witness data. Um, there's a concern in that case that um, without the witness data, you're missing signatures and stuff. And, and for that, I, I really need to emphasize that when transactions are on the block, there are signatures on them. Transactions have signatures. We're not, we're not dropping the signatures. But at the time of transition, there were nodes that didn't understand SegWit and they wouldn't see the, the signatures. So in addition to updating a transaction format and adding extra things to the transaction format, which is, which is a big deal, you also have this peer-to-peer -peer layer change because now you're negotiating to send this witness data around. And you have a transition that needs to happen in the peer-to-peer -peer layer. And you need to make sure you don't get forked. You need to make sure that people don't get confused and nodes don't start like thinking that they're sending each other invalid data and start banning each other. The network forks, like, you know, it was crazy. It was a very difficult thing to coordinate and a very difficult thing to test. And aside from the technical difficulties, of course, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, heat and noise happening. Uh, in public and in the, uh, the political sphere and a lot of like public relations stuff that we had to do. Taproot to contrast is much smaller. So in Taproot, what we do, and let me go back to SegWit real quick. One, one thing that SegWit included was a new versioning mechanism where um, what we think of as SegWit addresses, as SegWit outputs and transactions, was actually SegWit version zero outputs, meaning that on the blockchain, what you see is actually literally the number zero followed by a 32 byte hash or a 20 byte hash, depending on what you're doing. And what Taproot will be is a version of one SegWit output. And so we already have this version mechanism. Right now, when nodes see a version one output, they say, oh, well, there are no rules about version one outputs. I guess that's cool. I'll just let it go. Taproot is what's called a soft fork, meaning yeah. that it's strictly making the rules stricter. And the way that it makes it stricter is now after taproot, when nodes see a version one output, they'll say, oh, okay, that's actually a taproot output. It needs to be 32 bytes long. Those 32 bytes need to represent a public key. Um, that key, you know, it's allowed to be a hash or something. If the user proves that there's a hash, you know, then, then let them use the script that there that was hashed in. If they don't prove it was a hash, you know, they have to give a signature, you know, all, all, all the taproot rules and stuff. But what's cool is that this is very localized, right? We're not changing the transaction format. We're taking a version zero part of a transaction, changing it to a version one. It continues to be like before it was a zero and some blob. Now it's a one and some blob, right? The, the parsing is the same. The way that we interpret it is the same. What we're doing is in this narrow section of transaction validation, we're adding a bunch of extra rules saying, in case this is a version one, then go do all this extra taproot stuff. And all the extra taproot stuff is, is isolated, right? We don't really need to worry about the peer-to-peer -peer network. We don't need to worry about the format of blocks changing. We don't need to think about where does this extra data go or anything like that. It's just a normal looking transaction. And in fact, our goal was when we designed these BC, uh, BC1 addresses, 
was that you wouldn't even need to update your wallet software to understand the new address format because BC1Q to BC1P, right? It's all the same, it's all the same format, something called Dash32. And, um, and we almost achieved that. There are two things in our way. Um, one sort of, sort of political was that we didn't communicate this well enough and everyone writing wallets just thought that it had to be version zero, it has to be BC1Q. And so we did, uh, the folks at Optech did a bunch of uh, like um, testing of various wallet software and like basically nothing supported taproot uploads, even though they were supposed to. But we got lucky there because we also made a, a technical um, um, mistake, suboptimality. I can, I, I, I can massage it however I want, but um, there, um, there's an issue with SegWit addresses where if you allow links other than 20 and 32, the way that, that we do in SegWit v0, then it's possible to extend some addresses um, in a way that the checksum won't catch. So in particular, I think if it ends in a queue, then you can add an arbitrary number of extra queues to it. And so it'll be like visibly like something will be wrong, but the, the checksum will pass it. So there's a constant in the best 32 um, decoding formula that we needed to tweak. Like there's like one number that we, we set to zero and it should have been set to non-zero. So we're going to take the opportunity in, um, so even though Taproot also has fixed length, so we don't, we don't really worry about adding a bunch of extra queues. You know, it has to be 32 bytes. If it's not, it's wrong. For future, you know, we don't know what SegWit v2 will look like or v3 or v4. Um, so to really make this as flexible as we can, um, or even we might add a v1 that's like extra long or something and say that's going to be the next update, who knows. Um, in order to maximize flexibility, since wallets have to upgrade their wallet software anyway to, um, to allow um, version one instead of just version zero, we might as well ask them to also update this other constant from zero to non-zero. So there will unfortunately need to be wallet upgrades to support sending to SegWit, but fortunately it's very small. It's like adding two. So one other thing with SegWit, yeah, this whole new format, this whole new error correcting code, like new checks and algorithm, blah, blah, blah. Here we need like two constants. Like say this one doesn't have to be zero. And this one, if it's not zero, the first one's not zero, this other one has to be this other magic number. And that's all. Right. It's a, a two, two number patch. So. Well, I'm glad there's a, uh... We're surrounded by these super smart people like yourself and Peter Willey and Gregory Maxwell thinking about and working on these things. I, I've got no idea what you're talking about most of the time, but I know it's super important. Like, so I'm still always fascinated by it. Um, one of the things I have been aware of, though, is there has been a little bit of drama about activation. Like, what's going on here? Because um, it's 89% signaling support, but there's still some kind of drama around activating. Can you explain what's been going on here? why we haven't activated, what, what is required to you know, push us over the line? Yeah, yeah. Um, so fortunately, depending on your viewpoint, all of the drama this time feels like it's internally generated. There's sort of been, been like different phases to the drama that we're looking at. And for a long time, I would suggest for like all of 2019, say, we had this form of drama where nobody wanted to stick their neck out and actually start proposing an activation mechanism for Taproot. Everyone was everyone who who might have the um, like the know-how to come up with a proposal that people would go along with was so burned out after the SegWit thing. They were like, "Oh, this seems scary. There's going to be fights." So like, um, like I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to be in front of this. I don't want to have to be like on TV defending this against accusations and like making the protocol like more complicated or weaker or whatever, whatever things people might, mm -hmm. might uh, come up with. And then this morphed into what if, what if there's like an ASIC boost style, um, like opposition to this from miners, we need to come up with a proposal that somehow is insured against minor interference. And this, is a little bit silly. There's not, as I said, the, the way the taproot is um, designed, we're changing one part of a transaction that has a zero in it to another part of the transaction that has a one. Miners don't see it. There's no technical way by which this change could somehow bubble up to the level of proof of work. There, there could not be an ASIC boost style thing. But we didn't know that ASIC boost was being used the first time. So maybe we don't know this time, right? There's this like fear that some unknown thing will appear out of nowhere and like be the seed to create these like crazy conspiracies. 
And so there is this drive amongst large parts of the community to try to come up with an activation mechanism that somehow will avoid all the drama that we had in the past. And ironically, this desire to avoid drama is itself creating a lot of drama, right? Yeah. Because for, for two reasons. So one is if you have the miners on board in an activation, if you give them sort of like veto power that they had in SegWit, this actually makes things go a lot more smoothly, right? The idea is if we get all the miners to signal activation, if this is an honest activation, then when the network transitions over, even if um, there are a few nodes who haven't updated or, or something like that, you're not going to run the risk that a couple like un, un, um, unaware miners are going to keep extending the pre taproot chain and go um, create what, what would be invalid blocks from the perspective of the taproot validators, right? And then you get some sort of fork. And the concern is, suppose you had a majority of miners doing that. Well, now you have the chain with the most work on it, yep. ignoring taproot validity, is different from the chain of most work on it. If you follow taproot validity, that's, that's, that's a split, right? You don't want that. So by having this kind of overwhelming, like 90% minor signaling, you get a, a high degree of confidence that that won't happen. And there's a whole ton of what if scenarios that just go away, right? You, you get to mm -hmm. say like this deployment, even uh, under like catastrophic assumptions about how people upgrade and, and mistake people make deploying and like connectivity in the network. Um, you don't have like, you don't have crazy things. You don't have forks. You don't have people losing money, getting double spent, blah, blah, blah. So you really, you want, you want the miners to be, be on your side, right? And then the other reason that it's, um, that you want the miners on your side is because they're a big part of the ecosystem. And we had mm -hmm. one difficulty in the SegWit time is that it became this kind of animosity. There was like the miners were like the, the bad guys or, or they believed mm -hmm. they were being treated as the bad guys. And I think many people in the community did kind of view things that way. They're not, of course, they're providing a critical function in keeping the network running and they're taking tremendous financial and capital risks to do so. And you don't want a situation where miners as a group feel marginalized or where developers as a group feel marginalized by miners, right? There's, there's no, there's, you don't want that animosity. It's difficult to move forward as a network and you don't want these, um, um, you don't want those two groups to not like each other. Things don't move forward, there's bad blood. You, uh, you get weird things, you get, you get weird distortionary effects happening in the incentive of the system when you have that. And so, so that, was, that was a lot of the drama, was kind of like figuring out, like, do we want to use BIP8? Do we want to use BIP9? Approximately, BIP8 is like the miners um, get the veto. You know, we activate when you have a critical mass of miners. And then if you don't get a critical mass, then, uh, then that's the veto. Uh, BIP9 is roughly, there's like a flag gate you know, um, and like everyone has to upgrade their software. And if not enough people upgrade, then you like kind of back off in some socially coordinated way. But, um, but basically you, you get everyone to, to, to agree on some date in the future and then it happens whether have there's- Have got a some, date? Um, <laughs> Provi provisional so. date? When do you think we will be live by? When, okay, there we go. There's a question I can ask. I, I still think we're good by the end of the year. Um, or rather, I think we will be in on our way to activation by the end of the year in that there will be a scheme deployed. We will be like in the window where like a certain amount of signaling has to happen or whatever. Um, ages away. It is ages away. Um, although, yeah, it sucks. So there are- What are, are we waiting for? So there are a couple of necessary things. There are a couple of necessary <laughs> technical things to happen. Even yeah. if we all came to agreement right now on like what we need yeah. to do, you still need like probably a six, like, six to nine month lead time just okay. to get everybody to upgrade their software so everyone knows what the um what the parameters are get that deployed across the network get some measurements as to like how how widely deployed it is um that kind of stuff there's a bit of testing that we need to do um although we've done quite a bit of testing at this point but mostly uh the the delay is first of all getting agreement on some final things and then secondly you need that lead time to, to let the network upgrade to make sure everyone knows what the plan is Right. And so going, going back to the, the drama that we're looking at, um, fortunately, the drama has morphed from, um, from the sort of like, nobody wants to make a decision to like, nobody can agree on politically what we're doing to like people being, being freaking out about these hypothetical, um, maybe awful things happen, maybe like half the community turns on us or like, there's like some sort of civil war, like how can we, how can we come up with a design that's civil war proof, you know, that's, that's thought now. 
And now we're into a more familiar kind of uh, like bike shedding kind of era um, where we, the arguing this week is about whether uh, we set a flag date on um, based on a block height or whether we set a date based on a time, on the time that's in the block timestamps. And um, this is silly. This doesn't matter at all. It obviously doesn't. Like, that's such, such a minor thing. Um, the minor. Um, so the, the, the arguments on each side are roughly that uh, if you use a block height, that's pretty straightforward. That's really easy to deploy. Everybody knows what the block height is, right? I mean, you have a certain number of blocks, you know, when you get to, to a certain height. And we know, you know, blocks come roughly every 10 minutes. I guess the price is, is going up, so, so there are more miners coming on every day. So, so they're a bit faster than every 10 minutes. But we know roughly, you know, like within a day or two. If, if you want to uh, target a date in six months, you can do it with a block height and you'll be within a few days, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, versus using the block timestamps, where this is a, a piece of data that the miners put into the blocks, they have a, a couple rules constraining them, but for the most part, there are no global clocks in Bitcoin. So miners can, can kind of play with these timestamps a little bit. And so you get like a little bit of, of uh, concern about gamesmanship, concern about like what happens across reorgs, concerns, mm -hmm. you know, like it is more technical. So block is obviously simpler and easier to deploy on mainnet. It's much harder to deploy on testnet where you have almost the opposite scenario. Where on testnet, you usually have almost no hash power, but you've got a few like trollish people sitting around with like an exo hash of power. And whenever there's some like fun to, to be had with, um, with hash power, someone will do it. So like, right. I think people tried doing like a testnet deployment um, using the block height. And then like in 24 hours, there were 10,000 blocks from who knows, right? It just, these, these things happen on testnet. And then we'll get 10,000 block reorgs. And it's just, it's just, testnet sucks. <laughs> uh, are you, uh, uh, are you, we, we got a, we're like two minutes left. Okay. Are you nervous about this or are you just like, let's get this shit done? I, I think let's just get this shit done. So it, it's funny. I, I was hoping as we, um, I'm going to try to, to get a concluding statement here. I've been One hoping minute. that. In, in the last, uh, I guess, four to six weeks that we've been preparing for this, I have been talking to Andy Chow um, multiple times a week saying, what's the deal with Taproot? I got to talk to Peter from the comic. I got to tell him what's happened with activation. Yeah, I need to know. Right? Yeah, like this is important. Like he's not going to talk to me anymore. And yeah. then I'll be a pariah. Okay. And every time I talk to Andy, he's got a different thing that people are arguing about. <laughs> Which is great. It's wonderful to think they're moving. It's wonderful that we've got so much activity, like in, in IRC and on the mailing list and on Telegram and, and on GitHub and elsewhere. Um, and it's wonderful that the things that Andy describes to me every time seem to matter less and less and less. Like we're really like getting to the edges of where people are just gonna get tired of, of fighting about it. And so we still don't have a date and I still don't, like I don't have any specific thing that's blocking. So like, I mean, I give you this time thing that, who cares? It seems like we're uh, we all just need to wear each other out on arguing about stuff that doesn't matter, and uh, and then we'll have agreement in that sense. All right. And then well, we send that agreement out. People get on board, and it happens. If you, if you need my help, you just drop me a call. Yep. Yep, I'll I've help, got you. Uh, yeah, thank yeah, you. I, I'll help get it activated. No, seriously, it's brilliant, man. Love talking to you. I understand a little bit more every time I do. Uh, fingers crossed uh, we'll be traveling at some point this year hopefully hanging out are you going to Miami I am going to Miami yeah so hopefully hopefully I'll see you there yeah hopefully I'll see you in Miami um, but if not um, uh, sooner uh, good luck with with it all um, good luck with all the drama good luck with getting Taproot live uh, all us non-techies uh, who don't understand how this works in the background but uh, rely on Bitcoin really do appreciate the incredible work you do so you know from me thank you uh, great session. Next up, I'm going to be talking to Lisa Naigu. So see you later, Andrew. Yep. See you. Thanks, Peter. Bye.